Good evening. In entering a meditation, it is wisdom to find a comfortable position. For us, it is it has been found that a position where we sit erect, the feet on the floor, and hands or arms in the lap or on the table, enables us to keep the body out of our thought. And then we're ready for the meditation. And uh, either turn within and ask for the subject of your meditation or if one does not <coughs> readily come through you may take a subject of your own choosing and in our lesson last night it was given to us that we have dominion over our lives and that there is a way of preventing most, nearly all, of the world's discords from uh, acting upon us. And this, in this meditation, you will see the principle that enables us to come to that state of consciousness. Let us admit, first of all, that I have a body. Now this is you, of course. You are saying, I have a body. And I'm saying, I have a body. I have a body and this body is mine. I have control over this body so that my hands can't steal, my feet can't run away, I can't punch, throw my weight around, because I control the body. The body does not control itself. The body is responsive to my will. Now I have a mind and I do not permit my mind to think thoughts that come to it from the external world. I wish to use my mind to think my own thoughts. I wish to have as much control over my mind as I have over my body. I cannot waste energy letting my mind wander into idle subjects. For the mind is an instrument and it must be kept in as good a condition as the body. Now I do not turn my body over to someone else, neither do I turn my mind over to anyone else. I don't turn my body over to the world at large and I don't turn my mind over to the world at large. God gave me this mind and God gave me this body and I have dominion, God-given dominion, over mind and body so that nothing can in any wise enter my mind to violate my integrity, to cause distress or sin or disease or lack or limitation. 
I am always at the back of me thinking my thoughts through my mind and governing my body through my mind. I do not deliver my mind to another to work on. And I have learned that there is a silent, universal mind action, mesmerism, hypnotism, or malpractice, which uses the mind of an individual to inform the individual that there is infection or contagion or unemployment or a depression or bad weather. But now I take this mind and realize that it is my mind a God-given mind for my use and not the world. Therefore, I am not subject to the world's beliefs or the world's thoughts. I am not subject to the world's ambitions or lusts or malpractices. I am not subject to the world's ignorance or fears. For I am the father of one and all that the Father hath is mine, and I receive my guidance, my direction, my life, my law from God. And the will of God is done in me, in my mind and in my body. The law of God operates in me, in my mind and in my body, and I am subject only to the laws of God in mind and body. From within, which is the kingdom of God, from the kingdom of God within me, I receive divine impartations through my mind, governing my body and my home and my business. My home my business, my art, my profession, these are all encompassed within me and they are not subject to world beliefs. They are not subject to world malpractice. They are not subject to man whose breath is in his nostril for they are embodied within me and I have God-given jurisdiction over mind and body, over home and family, over business, art, profession, whatever my interest may be. I am not acted upon by outside influences, but the kingdom of God flows out from within me and acts as a law of good unto my mind and body and business under my home and health, under my business and art or whatnot. All jurisdiction comes from God, flows through me unto my world, my affairs. God is the governing agent, leading, directing, guiding, feeding, sustaining, maintaining, and all of this from within me, and therefore I do not lend my mind or body to any outside malpractice, to any outside beliefs of a universal or personal nature. I and my Father are one is the basis of this meditation, and all that the Father hath is mine, the place whereon I stand is holy ground. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. Now you see that that would be a meditation. And because 
that is a conscious activity of your consciousness it becomes the law unto you unfortunately world mesmerism is so great that you will undoubtedly feel the need to meditate again this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow morning and uh, you will not of course repeat that particular meditation or that form of meditation but some other subject will come up and uh, you will meditate on some other subject for instance <clears throat> One of the most fascinating subjects that will ever come up in your experience in, in your spiritual life will be that of human relationships. That is, your relationships within your family, your relationships within your community, your relationships within your business, and ultimately as a citizen of the world. And therefore, sooner or later, you will have to know the specific spiritual truth about relationships. Now my experience in that direction will be found summed up in the chapter Love Thy Neighbor in the book Practicing the Presence and in the chapter Relationship of Oneness in the Art of Spiritual Healing. And just briefly it goes like this. Since there is but one selfhood, one infinite divine self, one life, one mind, one being, the I or selfhood of me is the I or selfhood of you, of every member of my family, of every member of my business, of every member of my uh, community so that what I do unto you I am doing unto myself and all of my conduct has to be based on that any injustice I do to another is done unto me for there is but one me there is but one I, there is but one divine self, and that is yourself. And the love that I can express is being expressed unto me. It might seem that I am doing it unto you, but in the end it is coming back unto me because there is a spiritual law which says, cast thy bread upon the waters. And why does it say that? Because no bread can come back to you except that which you cast on the waters. Because every scrap of bread that's on the waters was put there by someone and it's earmarked for return to them. And you can only get your fingers burnt trying to take somebody else's bread. Cast your bread upon the waters and you will find that that which you send forth unto another is that which rebounds unto you. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption, which means if you cheat, lie, steal, defraud another, which is certainly sowing to the flesh, that is what must inevitably return. If you sow to the Spirit, if you permit love, justice, mercy, benevolence, forgiveness to flow out from you, you reap life everlasting. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. And that's a spiritual law too. As ye sow, now you see, people don't believe it, but that's why people are getting in trouble and then wondering why. And they never stop to think that they have just been in church repeating that as ye sow, so shall ye reap. 
accepting that law for themselves, putting it around their neck and then pulling the rope. Because it is true that whatever law you accept becomes the law unto you. And if you sow to the flesh, if you sow for gain at somebody else's expense, if you sow to injustices, if you sow to slanders and scandal-mongering, that's what you uh, have to reap. It is the cosmic law of Scripture. So it is. The bread that you cast on the waters returns to you. And that's why you have to be careful not to send sour bread stale bread, bad bread, because that is the bread that returns unto us. And we have not accepted the teaching of Jesus Christ on this score literally, or we would have known hundreds of years ago that we are digging our own graves by our conduct and by our atmosphere to others. For what you do unto others is the measure that returns to you pressed down and running over. Now, as you remember then, and you may think of it this way, <coughs> I am you. The I of me is the I of you. And when I take money from my pocket and give it to you, it's just as if I took it out of my right hand pocket and put it in my left-hand pocket. It is earmarked for return, and usually with interest. In the same way, the forgiveness that I give to another, I'm giving to myself, and quickly, quickly, it will return unto me. That which I hold another in bondage to eventually I myself am held in bondage to, it must inevitably be. For there is but one I, there is but one ego, there is but one selfhood, and the selfhood of me is the selfhood of you. Even nations do not know that their acts, the cumulative acts of all their citizens together, decides their ultimate fate. There are those who really and truly believe that you can commit war and have a victory. They believe that you can go to war for any reason and in the end not pay back every single bit that you have handed out. And those who have had the vision to watch the wars even of our generation, just those from 1898 to this present time, must certainly know what has happened to everybody involved in war, whether they were on the right side or the wrong side, because there is no right side to war. Now, <clears throat> even if we are not wholly responsible for uh, the acts of our government, to some extent we are because we participate in the benefits of those acts. But for our purpose at this present time, we will deal only with our individual acts, our individual conduct within our family circle, within our business circle, within our community circle. And uh, let us remember this. I must live eternally as if what I am doing to you, I am doing to myself. And if I do not keep that in mind, sooner or later I will be led astray by thinking that I can benefit at your expense, that you can benefit at someone else's expense. And so it goes in an endless circle. Therefore. It is a wonderful thing, at least once a day, to have a few minutes of meditation on this subject, I. I. I, 
there is only one infinite life my life is your life and therefore what I do to your life I'm doing unto my own there is only one spiritual soul infinite and eternal and immortal and anything I do to your soul I am doing to my own the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and so there is only one supply anything I do to your supply I am doing unto my supply and then you will see that meditation such as that begin to change your whole outlook toward this world because now you can no longer divide them up into Jew and Greek you can no longer divide them up into bond and free you can no longer divide them up into black and white now it becomes evident to you that underneath the skin or in that kingdom of God within us we are one in Christ Jesus meaning we are one in spiritual sonship we are one we are branches all of the same vine and anything that affects one branch is bound eventually to affect all branches another time our meditation may take us to the subject of supply because there isn't anyone in the world so rich that they do not need as many lessons on supply as those who have nothing because the subject of supply does not have to do with how many dollars you have how many dollars you have tonight may have no relationship at all to how many dollars you may have a week from tonight and I think most of us in this room have uh, lived through the periods of bearing witness to that fact and therefore we can't count supply by how many dollars we have at the moment we have to think of supply from an entirely different subject than one of dollars plus or minus and when we begin to meditate on the subject of supply the very first thought that comes into mind is the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof Son, thou art ever with me, all that I have is thine. All right, then, let us surrender in this minute the personal sense of possession and realize that it is literally true. Whatever I have has come forth from God and for all of me can return to God even this minute. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the trees and the mines, the oceans and the pearls, the diamonds and the gold, the crops, the fruits, the berries. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. before there was a human being on earth this was true if there should ever be a time when there'll be no human beings on earth it will still be true this earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof any deed that we may have to a part of it is just a temporary arrangement the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof but son thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine ah yes here comes another if you are the Christ tell these stones to turn into bread oh no 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 I won't do that It is God's function to feed me. It is not my function to take thought. 
God's function. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Aha! Now we're commencing to see what supply is. Supply is the word of God. Supply is every word of truth that comes from the kingdom of God within. Every word of truth that I entertain in consciousness, every word of truth that I abide in or that I permit to abide in me, this is my supply. So, since God is spirit, supply must be spiritual. Since God is spirit, all of God's creation must be spiritual. Therefore, supply must be spiritual. And that is why we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Aha! No wonder he said, if you abide in this word and let this word abide in you, you will bear fruit richly. What difference does it make whether he said bread or fruit or meat? It's all the same thing. It means substance, it means supply. Speaking of supply, he said, yes, he told us what supply is in plain English. He never said supply is money or property. He said, I is supply. I am the bread. I am the wine. I am the water. I am the meat. In other words, I am all forms of supply. I am even life eternal. I am even the resurrection. Oh, now, let's meditate. Let's meditate. Man shall not live by bread alone. We do not have to earn our living by the sweat of our brow. Why? Because supply is spiritual. And it is closer to me than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. I already have it in infinite abundance. How can I say that? Because I can say I. Did you ever stop to think? that by saying I, you were declaring the source of bread, meat, wine, water, resurrection, life eternal? Just think, closer to you than breathing and nearer than hands and feet is infinite supply for I. I in the midst of me is supply. I in the midst of me is bread, meat, wine, water. So that now I do not have to take thought for supply. I do not have to go out to sweat to earn my supply. Now I can go out to my work for the joy of the work, for the joy of success, for the joy of service, for the joy of the work itself because my supply is not dependent on my work. My supply is dependent on my understanding of the fact that I am supply. I embody supply. I include within me the meat of life, the wine of life, the water of life, the bread of life, the staff of life. The within that I, which is my own being, within that I, within me, is all that I have been seeking out in the world. And so now I can go out into this world without thinking of earning a living. But let's think now how well I can do this job. Let us think how many ways I can serve, whether it's my employer or the public regardless of what its name or nature, let us see how many ways I can be useful, how many ways I can bless. If I can't do anything else, I can bring with me the power of forgiveness so that 
wherever I see sin or disease or death, I can say, neither do I condemn thee. Thou art forgiven. Thou art forgiven. Be thou whole. If I can do nothing else in my work, I can be a benediction at every stop by realizing God with you. God is with you. Emmanuel, peace be unto this household. Peace be unto this business office. Peace be unto this customer. Peace be unto this client. Since supply is spiritual, I can give everybody an infinity of supply all day long. A supply of love, supply of gratitude, a supply of forgiveness, a supply of commendation, a supply of peace on earth. Peace, peace, my peace give I unto thee. And see how different that is than earning a living. Because now I know the truth. Because I am a son of God, I am an heir of God. And if an heir, joint heir to all of the heavenly riches. That's why I don't have to work for a living. I am a son of God. I within me is the son of God. I within me is the very Son of God, and it is the source of all supply. And so now I'm free just to go out and bless, to give, to serve. And so you see, another meditation takes up that subject of supply. There are times when because of the news of the day the thought of danger is in the air and this brings us to the subject of safety and security and so again we have a brief period for meditation except the Lord build a house they labor in vain that build it well except the Lord be my protection now. It'd be a waste of time for me to try to protect myself from all the germs in the world and all the bullets in the world and all the accidents in the world and all the automobiles in the world and all the airplanes in the world. They're just too many for one little me. And so I might as well give up and realize that the presence of God is my security. In thy presence is fullness of life. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, safety, security. Except the Lord build round about me a sure defense, it would be foolish for me to try to defend myself from the evils of this world. Except the Lord build a house, I would labor in vain. Except the Lord keep the watch, the watchman waketh but in vain. And so it is that if I don't have the Lord for my policeman, all the policemen on the beat can't save me. All the policemen in the city can't save me. Except the Lord keep the watch. And the Lord is keeping the watch for I and the Father are one. Where God is, I am. Where I am, God is. For I am in God and God is in me, for we are one. And so you see, that subject has been covered. And so it is that from day to day, as you have your meditations, each time you will find some different subject. Each time you'll find that the subject works themselves out differently. That is one of the beauties of this work, that you need not memorize anything. In fact, memorizing uh, things is very harmful. Very. Because you would be depending 
on a broken reed if you depend on anything that you remember. You are not to depend on your memory, you're to depend on God. And your memory isn't God. Therefore, your meditations must be spontaneous. They must be original. Each time you turn within, you must remember that we do not live on yesterday's manna. That is a wonderful statement, both for supply, whether the supply is of dollars or the supply is of treatments. We do not live on yesterday's manna. God's manna falls as we need it. And we never have to pick enough to last until tomorrow. And so it is, you don't have to remember any statements of truth for tomorrow. You don't have to fill your head with memorizing truth. Because it won't do you any good. All you'll have in your mind is a lot of words and thoughts. And that can never be God. The Word of God is something that comes up spontaneously within you. Therefore, you never need concern yourself with what you are going to think or even what truth you're going to use in a treatment. You will find that as you read the books, as you hear tapes, enough truth will be planting itself in your consciousness so that when there is a need for truth, something of a spontaneous nature will come forth just to meet that need. We do not live by bread alone, and we do not live on yesterday's manna. Sufficient unto the day is the need thereof. And so it is that when you must give a treatment, don't try to memorize a treatment that healed a cancer yesterday because it may not heal a cold or a headache today. Don't try to memorize a treatment that brought somebody employment today because it may not bring him a farthing tomorrow. But as you turn to the Father within, you have an infinite storehouse. And then what comes through spontaneously is the Word of God. Never forget this because it's important. If you have to sit in a class and listen to a lot of made-up statements or made-up treatments or made-up meditations or remembered uh, classes from last year or the year before, you'd weary of it. In fact, you wouldn't be attracted to it. It is only the spontaneity of God that can hold us. And so it is that it is only the spontaneity of God that can meet our need. The Word of God is quick and sharp. And when he uttereth his voice, the earth melteth. And now let me show you a principle. If I could recite all of the truth that's in the Bible and in all the metaphysical writings, that wouldn't be God uttering his voice. That would just be me parroting. And there's no spiritual power in parroted statements of truth. It has to be the Word of God that He utters, not you, not me. When He uttereth His voice, the earth melteth. So if you're going to give a treatment, sit down, close your eyes, and turn to the Father within. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Now, you may give a treatment yourself of whatever truth you know, but don't stop there. Don't feel that that's the treatment because it isn't. That is only the preparation for the treatment. The treatment is when you are through with your particular uttering of truth and then can say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. I've had my say, now you have yours. And you can listen. Be still. And then wait for something to come through from within. It doesn't have to be a message. It can just be a deep breath. It can just be a feeling of release. It can be a weight dropping from the shoulders. It makes no difference how it comes. You will know when it comes. Then you can say, ah, he uttered his voice. Now the arrow will melt. 
As a matter of fact, sometimes it does instantaneously, sometimes it doesn't, and you'll get a call later and you may have to repeat it. But it's always the same thing, even if you have to stay on the case a year. Always remember that the object is to let your treatment carry you as far as it will, and then wait, and see if you can't wait for God to utter his voice. For when he uttereth his voice, the earth melteth. His word is strong and powerful and instantaneous. And that brings us to this uh, subject of what is grace? <clears throat> grace is that which comes into our experience not because we've earned it, not because we're worthy of it, not because we're deserving of it. It comes as a spontaneous gift of God or a spontaneous activity of God. It is that which Paul described when he said, I live yet not I, Christ liveth my life, meaning that I merely carry out out here on the outer plane that which it gives me to do. Or, as it is voiced, he performeth that which is given me to do. He perfecteth that which concerneth me. Well, when you remember that and you have a task to do and all of a sudden you find it done better than you could have done it or more promptly, more quickly or more profitably, then you will know that there was an agency operating above and beyond your human intelligence or your human strength. If I might illustrate that with this. I was driving from San Francisco after one of my classes to Hollywood, to my home, and uh, I was just coming through Santa Maria when I heard the voice distinctly say, He performeth that which is given me to do. Now up to that time, I didn't know that passage in Scripture. If I'd ever read it, it hadn't registered. If I'd ever heard it, it hadn't registered. It was absolutely new and strange, but from the sound of it, I knew that it must be scriptural. And I always carry with me a Bible that has a concordance attached to it in the back. And so I stopped the car and looked up that particular passage and I found it. I found there is a passage that says, He performeth that which is given me to do. But I also found another one that said, He perfecteth that which concerneth me. And I thought, well, I don't know what meaning they have in my life, but evidently something is going to take place, and this is a way of telling me that it's already performed and that he has performed it. He, this God being, God power within me. So I drove on home, and I was in the house about a half hour when the telephone bell rang. And Hawaii was on the telephone, and this is before I'd ever been there. And there was a friend on the phone, a friend who was down there on business, and she said that her husband had just been advised by the doctors there was no further hope, it was a heart case, and uh, although he had never been interested in any form of truth, now he felt he had nothing to lose by turning to it. And would I take his case? Of course I would. These people had been friends. In fact, all of the family but this man had been patients and students for 20 years. 
and he had been a friend even though he had no interest in this work of course I would take the case well will you come over and give him greater assurance yes I'll come over I've just finished the class and I have a few weeks in between and uh, then uh, she told me that they would see that my transportation reached me and I would go well on the morning that my transportation reached me a cablegram came from one of the other islands in Hawaii saying we have just found your books do you ever come to Hawaii we would like to have instruction well you know I commenced to smile then I can commence to see this he performeth that which is given me to do it looked as if I was going over there to a ready-made uh, opportunity and it so happened because when I got there this man was at the boat to meet me and a woman had been brought over from one of the other islands within a few weeks she had her healing and as a result of those two healings my work in Hawaii began and when it was all over it was so evident how little I had to do with those healings all I had to do was be obedient and go but he had gone before the presence had gone before to make the crooked places straight and believe it or not on that trip I was invited to talk for unity and before I left there I had an invitation to come back and spend two months with unity as their minister that was the beginning of a tremendous activity and it all came with no conscious thought desire or will on my part because Hawaii was as far away from my thought at that time as Timbuktu is at this time and uh, here it is brought into me by he performeth that which is given me to do now that is grace I didn't have to earn I didn't have to sweat I didn't have to plan or plot I didn't have to sit up nights to heal I had only to be obedient and let that presence or power go before me to prepare a place for me and to make the crooked places straight and to do the healing work and that is an act of grace now don't you think that for me to come here to Los Angeles and find such audiences as we had Monday Tuesday and Wednesday night and such a class as we have now don't you think that's an act of grace do you think that I humanly could do anything to create this class or those lecture audiences do you think anyone could humanly plot it or plan it or labor over it no 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 by the grace of God my function only is when something within says go to Los Angeles go but then find that he performeth that he brings together the group he brings together the class he provides the subject for the teaching and uh, as the master said I can of my own self do nothing the father within me do it the work and he does it by grace not because I deserve it not because I've earned it it isn't that at all it's God performing its function through us and let no one believe that you can go out and travel this world and see such lecture audiences and such classes come together as have come together in Africa and Australia and New Zealand and uh, England and Holland and Germany never believe that you can do that by human might or by human power because you can't there is no way to make that happen <clears throat> you could get numbers of people together that by advertising yes but that's not fruitful uh, lecture work or class work that's just a human activity but such works as we have witnessed this is the grace of God and so it is when you begin to realize in your business that business begins to come to you that you yourself had made no human effort to get or a bigger volume than you yourself had 
thought possible. Or that ideas came to you out of the blue. Then you begin to understand the nature of grace. Now where does grace take place? Grace takes place where you prepare for it. In other words, again, it's back to the first and second commandments. How to illustrate this. If we have a desire to know God aright, whom to know aright is life eternal, and if we devote our energies to seeking to know God aright, eventually we not only come to know God aright, but we find that all these things have been added unto us. Now, we weren't thinking about the things, we weren't thinking about the demonstrations, we weren't thinking about places and persons. Our whole mind was stayed on God. We were seeking to know Him aright, and then all these things were added. And they came because the moment we came into the presence, we found that in thy presence is fullness. The minute we attained the presence, the fullness was there. That is why we have, as one of our subjects, demonstrate God, not things. The very moment you think that you can use God as a means to attaining something, you're cutting yourself off from grace. Even if you attain it, you'll work hard for it. Because there's no room for grace. It is only as we seek and attain the consciousness of the presence of God that that presence goes before us and draws all things to us. There is no way, really, of using God to attain our purposes. And we lose the demonstration of grace when we think that here is me, and there is God, and here is my demonstration, whether it's home or companionship or supply. And if we think that we can go to God and get this, we haven't even started in the kindergarten of a spiritual teaching, because the secret is this. There is no me and God. And there is no God and supply, or God and companionship, or God and safety. Those things only exist in fiction. The story that they exist began in the pagan days, and it just has been perpetuated. Now this is the truth. You can't go to God. For I and the Father are already one, right here. So there's no place to go, and there's no one to go to. I and the Father are one. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. For I and the Father are one, and all that I, God, am is mine. It is already included here within me, so that since God is the substance of all creation, remember God made all that was made and all that God made is good. God and his creation is one. So you can't go here to God to get something here, and you can't even get outside of yourself to find God, for God is yourself, capital S-E-L-F. God is the self of you. And that was the revelation that shocked the world when Moses gave it to the world. I am that I am. I am that I am. Oh, Moses quickly told his brother, don't go down there and tell those people, 
heavens, don't go down and tell them. They'll never believe it. They are still thinking of a great big man with a beard up here on a cloud. And they're still thinking they can pray to it and get something from it. And here it is, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, and I am it. That I that is within me is my God being. And therefore, whenever he had to commune with God, he had Aaron to watch to see that the Hebrew people didn't come to look because they were sure that God and Moses were having a talk up there. They were, but it wasn't up there. It was in here. Moses knew it and Aaron knew it. But had they come up and not seen a God, they would have said, Aha, he's faking. You see, there is no God. We looked all around and there wasn't any. And he knew that. He knew they could only believe what their eyes could see. At that stage of their development, and so he couldn't tell them. And do you know that for centuries and centuries and centuries, only the high priests of the Hebrew faith were allowed to know the name of God. And they were never under any conditions allowed to voice it, except when they were inside that sanctuary with the Holy Ark. And that's why the Hebrew people never discovered the name of God. Now, Jesus Christ, as it is now being revealed, was crucified because he decided to go out and tell the truth to the people. He told them for the first time since Moses, I am he. I, the Father within you, am he. My father and your father is within you. Not up there, not in holy mountains to be worshipped, not even in holy temples to be worshipped, but neither low here and neither low here within you. Well, that was betraying the secrets of the Hebrew hierarchy. And he was crucified for telling it to them, but by the grace of John, it got into print. Now, at least it got into manuscript form. Every mystic who has ever lived from records that we think of as three to 4,000 BC up to this present time, every mystic has received the same revelation. I, the one ego, the one mind, closer than breathing, nearer than hand and read. In fact, one of the great English mystics was able to say in a poem, before God was, I am. Meaning, before there ever was this nonsensical God that somebody called God out here and prayed to, before there ever was such a fictitious personage, I am. And that's the truth. Before there were any fairy tales about a Santa Claus God that rewards you when you're good, punishes you when you're bad. Before there was any Santa Claus God sitting up there holding back your blessings until you found the right church or the right teacher or the right practitioner or until you went into church with a hat on or with a hat off or with shoes on or with shoes off. All that nonsense about God has been perpetuated because up until now it hasn't been possible for human consciousness to accept the great revelation. The kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. No longer shall you pray in holy mountains, nor yet in Jerusalem, for the kingdom of God is within you. Do not pray to be seen of men, but when you pray, enter the sanctuary of your spirit. Enter the secret place within yourself, the secret place of the Most High, and the God that seeth in secret will reward you openly.